Hey, Tom. How are you? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Tong, we can't hear you yet. You're still uh, muted. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for that, giving me this opportunity. Do you want to test out your slides? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, let me have a look. I will try first. Do you know how to share? I'm looking for it. Um, so where is it? So the so the file, your PowerPoint. Yeah, I, the... I, find, I find my PowerPoint, and um, I don't know which to click so, to so share the... my screen. Yeah, at the bottom there's a green button that says share screen. Ah, I see it. Yeah, great. Oh, good. Okay. Did you looks, see it? I see it. Yeah, looks good. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And then you could stop sharing for now. We'll have some other introductory things, and then you could start again afterwards, if that's okay with you. Okay, I can just start talk now. No, 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 no. I said you can stop sharing now and then. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I can, yeah. And then we'll start it again afterwards. Yeah, sure. Do you know how to stop sharing? I'm trying. Stop sharing. I see this. Yes. Yeah. How's your campus doing? It's good. We are normal now. Okay, what's normal? Normal means you can go out and go in <laughs> and to do what? Go to work every day. Okay, but you have to take a COVID test every day? No, um, they have extended that to like every other day. So oh. 48 hours. Okay, even if you leave campus? Yeah, you okay. can leave campus. Cool. Do you have to teach this semester? Yes, I have about 24 hours of teaching, teaching load. Per year or per semester? This semester. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I only have to teach nine hours per year. Per year. Oh. oh. They tried to ask me to teach one more hour, but I said, no way. Oh. You should teach more because you're a very good teacher. Um, I don't know about that. You're a very good teacher. I enjoy your talks at least. Oh. Well, talks are different than teaching. Um, yeah, sort of. Talks are easy. Teaching is hard. <laughs> really? Oh, I enjoy teaching. Uh, I enjoy teaching, teaching that. Teaching, you really have to know what you're talking about. Talks, you could just, just <laughs> teaching you really have to. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, Stone, thanks for coming. Hey, hey, I'm. Hey. Good to see you. Do you want to sure. test your slides? Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I think it's fine, but uh, only some, sometimes my network got slow, actually. Oh, well, let's, yeah. let's test. Test out sharing, see if it works. Oh, okay. And then do you have a backup network? 
Yeah, can, let me let me try. Okay, Let's see. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a movie or things like that, so. Mm -hmm. No, okay. seems okay. Do the um, full screen, please. Do the uh, the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Can you do the um, slideshow view? What, what? Do this to the uh, slideshow view. Oh, are you, can you see that slide? No? Yeah, but do it as a slideshow, the play. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think that the... No, click, Aaron. click yeah. slideshow. I'm parking my car, so I'm getting off in a few minutes. Stone, do you know how to do that? Slideshow view? Huh? I Sorry. Do the I, do the slideshow view. Yeah, I I, I uh, did I did I show that slides? You show the yeah, slide. Yeah. Click the play button. Click the button to do view slideshow. Right now it's it's not oh. on the slide presentation view. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, no, you stopped sharing. Yeah, I stopped this. Let me see if I can do it again. Um, huh? I think... Uh, Hi, Jen. Hi, Aaron. You're in which Hi. system? <laughs> Hi. All right. I'll come back on Saturday. Oh, you are? Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Stone, right. can you share your... hmm. Sorry, one second. Stone, can you do slides? Share your slides? I'm trying. I'm trying to. Click the green button. Yeah, good. Uh, let me see. Um, it seems it did. Oh, it's, yeah, it's very slow, actually. Do you have your uh, 5G network on your phone you can use? Hey guys, I'm parking my car just a minute. Okay. So. It looks like it's slow loading. Um, Stone, can you hear us? You're still muted. 
where did we go? Hey, can you see the slides? No, close your, no, you, you need to share your screen. I'll share that again. Uh, let me see. Uh, can you hear? Can um, we cannot see your slides, um, and we can't really hear you that well. I think you need to find a better network. Can you hear us, Stone? Yes, yeah, Stone is very slow. I, I let him know. Probably. Yeah, please, Stone, please sure. talk to sure, him. Sure, sure. Get, his, get mm -hmm. his network straightened out. Sure, sure, uh, sure, sure. No problem. Yeah, I'm getting my office in a bit. Okay, so Stone, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> All right. I just click, I just the click play, click the slideshow view. Is that on? Yeah, okay. Yeah, slides on. Yeah, that look, yeah, that looks good. Okay. Are you happy with that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you'll be the second speaker. So you can stop sharing now, but then you'll be ready to share when it's your turn. Okay. Okay. Um, let's get started. So um, welcome everyone to another NeuroZoom week. And uh, before we get started with uh, Tong's and Stone's talks, please tune in next week for uh, two more uh, NeuroZoom talks. We, um, uh, yeah, Stone, don't, don't share your slides. Oh, my fault, sorry. No, it's not your fault. Um, uh, Next next week we have um, two uh, speakers. We have uh, Qin Yong Ang, postdoc from Xiao Wei Zhuang's lab, talking to us about uh, spatial epigenomics, and we have uh, Peng Shi from uh, Zhejiang University talking to us about microglia and um, cardiovascular function. So uh, please keep letting me Zhuang know if you want to present your work. Postdocs, students can talk. PIs, uh, looking forward to hearing the latest. Okay, so um, now let me introduce our first speaker today, um, Dr. Tong Wang. Uh, Tong is an assistant professor at Shanghai Tech University. She uh, did her PhD at the Institute of Neuroscience in Shanghai with uh, Jinge Luo, um, and here she uh, worked on uh, mechanisms of membrane trafficking during axon growth. And uh, she had a really cool paper in developmental cell during her PhD in uh, which she discovered a mechanism to uh, explain how uh, membrane is trafficked during axon axonal growth. She uh, discovered that uh, a protein called LGL1, which is the homologue of the lethal giant larvae gene in uh, Drosophila, how that plays a, a critical role functioning upstream of uh, RAB10. 
And uh, she showed this in vitro and in vivo and provided insights about how um, uh, membrane trafficking contributes to axon growth. She then went to Australia to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. And she continued studying axonal trafficking, but he, and she had many papers, she, um, um, including a really cool one where she solved the problem about how uh, axons are too, the diameter of axons are too thin to allow large cargo to go and to go all the way down. And she, she figured out um, using uh, super resolution microscopy, live cell imaging, how actomyosin 2 uh, contractility allows the uh, axon to locally expand and contract to allow cargo to transport. And sort of disruptions of this process can underlie um, some of the events in neurodegeneration. So uh, based on those studies, she launched her own lab very recently at Shanghai Tech, where she continues to use imaging and studies of um, ax axonal trafficking. And she'll share with us some of her, her latest work. So please go ahead, uh, Tong. Thanks for the warm introduction. And, uh, oh, where is my mouse? Sorry. Hey, something wrong with my computer. Give me a second. Okay, I find it. Share. Can you, can you see the screen? Looks good. Okay, um, thanks Aaron for the um, warm introduction and really thank you all for giving me this opportunity to share my recent works in the Neuro Zoom talks. And uh, I start very nervous and uh, the um, work I'm going to share with you is uh, recently going on in my lab and um, the topic is a novel mechanoprotective mechanism in axons of central nervous system. And uh, the topic is based on the axon and it's about our nervous system. Um, so here is our nervous system, which is a connect connecting machine, basically. It transmits the, all these processed information to our peripheral organs. And the uh, majority of the length of our nervous system is due to our extended um, axon. So from the... Um, in the uh, original preparations of Kaha that several hundred years ago that we can see that axons have a very long and thin axon and the diameter of the axons can in our human body can exceed one meter, but diameter is um, around one micrometer. So the axon is extremely long. So for a single cell to maintain such an extremely extended structure, this is a, a challenging work to maintain the structural stability for a single cell. Okay, so there's no wonder that the axons is faced with a lot of challenges to cause its uh, pathology, um, including the factors listed here, like uh, um, oxidative stress, uh, accumulation of the um, uh, aggregates of the of the protein aggregates, and uh, on top of that, because it's very long. 99% uh, of the length of the nervous system is on axon. It has a much, much higher risk of get mechanically impacted um, on the route of its projecting by the, um, by the external forces. So here um, is an axon. Acute um, mechanical stress, like sudden uh, acceleration and thick acceleration of the head is going to cause a uh, deformation of the axons in all the directions, in fact, not axial radio, but also the torches. And therefore, um, it will lead to non-disruptive axonal injuries, as well as the axotomy, which completely um, disruption of the axon. This is a rare condition. Most of the conditions, axons are not completely disrupted, but later on, a um, within the that matter of the uh, impacted nervous system, diffuse axonal injury will be um, noticed scattered around the wet matter axons. And um, in the cellular level, the focal axonal swellings, FAS, is very prevalent in these injured axons. Um, so people uh, used to think that axons are um, selectively vulnerable um, towards the mechanical stress. And uh, consistent with this, 
repeated uh, but mild mechanical stress like contact sports, um, like boxing or uh, score or, or uh, soccer, sorry, soccer games that can give the athlete um, repeat but mild mechanical uh, injury. And uh, chronic effects of this uh, mechanical st stimulation is going to accumulate in the mechanically most vulnerable um, brain regions and uh, lead to a um, situation, degenerative disease called CTE. And uh, along the CTE brain tissues, um, CTE can only be diagnosed by uh, auto autopsy. And there is tall tangles and also uh, very prevalent with the axon, uh, vocal axonal swellings and axonop uh, axonopathies. However, um, that we, we have already know that the axons are very fragile. However, um, daily mechanical stress, like um, drumping, sky drumping, or even sneezing, can lead to up to two to 5% of the deformation of our soft brain. brain. However, um, this sort of strain is not going to leave any significant axonal injuries. So um, based on these observations and background, uh, we seems to have a uh, question, uh, a knowledge that mechanical stress is going to harm the axon. But however, it has a kind of resistance range. Um, it, it can endure certain levels of mild mechanical stress. So um, for within this threshold, it is not going to be harmed by the daily mild mechanical stress. So our first question is going to um, address is that Axonal are these axons are, are actually resistant to mild mechanical stress? And if so, what are these underlying mechanisms for this for their resistance? So interestingly, um, there is a um, work in 2017 from Gu Chen's lab that they find that mechanical uh, stress um, from the puff of the culture medium to the cultured uh, neurons, to the uh, axons of the cultured neuron, can edu induce a reversible axonal beatings um, on these axons. And uh, what they found, found is that um, these beatings is dependent on the existence of TRIP4, which is the uh, mechanical sensory channels on the surface. Um, and also, um, if the uh, influx calcium is going to uh, activate the disassembly of the microtubule and cause the swellings and the degeneration of the axon. However, um, what is the um, physiological function of these reversible axonal beatings uh, caused by this um, mild stress um, delivered by the puff? And what is the molecular um, what is the molecular drivers directly create them? And uh, are these are these beatings can reflect a kind of structural plasticity to resist uh, mechanical stress is still unknown. So we, when I start my lab uh, before the pandemic, I want to address this question. But first, the challenge we are facing is that there is no suitable models to study the mild mechanical stress on Exxon. Um, for this. Really sorry about that. Um, okay. um, for the con conventional, uh, for the conventional axonal injury models, the axons were just basically uh, completely um, disrupted by laser or by uh, forces lesion. And for this diffuse, non-disruptive uh, disruption, disruption models, um, injury models like PUF. Um, the problem is that PATH cannot control the uh, situ uh, control the intensity and the position of the um, damage, and uh, the stretch model um, basically just injures every part of this neuron, not only the axon but also the soma. And it it is also the stretch model cannot uh, um, is not compatible with the uh, live imaging. So we start the model based on the microfluidic um, based on the microfluidic um, uh, techniques that we can see the um, neurons in the reservoir and uh, wait until these axons uh, go across into uh, this we call the uh, middle axon injury channels and then we inject various flux uh, 
uh, flux into flux of culture medium into the central um, the, uh, central channel and to cause the flux induced uh, stress to this crossing axons. So this uh, model is compatible with most of the um, live imaging microscope. And we also use the uh, computational fluid dynamics um, techniques to um, analyze the distribution of the stress as well as the um, as well as the velocity in our device. And we found that the velocity and the stress are evenly distributed in this injury uh, chamber only, not affecting uh, the other soma part. Um, and uh, also they are linearly correlated with the uh, injecting speed. So we can uh, theoretically, we can exert um, flow induced mechanical stress to the axon exclusively um, and uh, control the extent of the uh, stress uh, using the uh, flux velocity. So it is easy to assemble. Um, we, this is a device that we inject the flux and then we observe the uh, instant response of the axon with inverted microscope. And here is the actual image we have that with the flux in, we can see how this axon will react. So the first uh, um, speed we try is very high. It's the uh, 1000 microliter per minute and it's clearly caused axotomy. And we noticed that before the axotomy actually happens, the, there is a sudden increase of the calcium signal. Uh, this green one is transfected with the calcium uh, sensor, cal, um, um, GCAM 6F, and then the disruption happens. So, but with a slower uh, speed of 200 microliters per minute, we can induce a non-disruptive axonal injury. First, we can see the typical bleeding happens, and then um, very prevalent um, wave-like uh, uh, calcium increase along the axon. This is a shortly. This happened shortly after the flow. So, as we summarize the here, um, for this very high speed flux, we can induce a um, calcium surge and then the axotomy. With this slower speed, we can induce a bleeding followed by a much more higher um, flow of the uh, much more higher uh, calcium surge and the swelling of these um, beating areas. So um, we conclude that, and this is not reversible. Um, and we conclude that this calcium, the second waves, there are actually two waves. One wave is very like restricted. The second waves is much more wider and stronger and triggers a um, swelling of the beating areas. And uh, we also examined the um, skeleton changes as we know that the axons was covered with the so-called membrane associated periodic settled skeleton structure, which is typically, um, which is represented by the 180 nanometer spaced actin rings. And we can see these uh, actin rings in the uh, intact um, axons before the flux and after the 200 uh, microliter flux. And we can see that largely the, period, uh, the periodic of these actin rings are largely disrupted, suggesting that the injury to this axon is not reversible. And we also examine the final fate of this injur injured axons using the degenerative markers, um, cal clip cusp 3 as well as the SCG10. And we can see that a significant increase um, in both the uh, markers in this um, stressed axon with the 200 uh, microliter per minute flux. And so with this method, we have established a, um, a platform, a kind of method to induce um, exclusive axon injury um, with the AOC. And then um, the next step we want to understand is that what about the very mild um, speed flux, is the axon is going to be resistant um, to this speed of flux. And we have summarized the here that the higher speed is going to cause irreversible axonal injuries, but lower speed, what about lower speed? For lower speed, um, in, for lower speed flux, we can see that it's very clear. We can see a reversible axonal beating happens um, in the axon. 
And uh, in this higher resolution um, time-lapse images, we can see that within the seconds of the flux um, injection, um, there is clear beating process of the axon. And then uh, the beating is going to largely recovered. And everything happens within about um, 20 minutes. So to capture this dynamic process of axonal beating, we have developed a automatic method to quantify um, it, uh, to quantify the movies. And uh, using this uh, method, we have find out that um, the 50 uh, microliter per minute flux, which is the uh, typical uh, very, very slow, mild stress conditions that we use, indeed can re induce a lower peaked um, axonal beatings as well as a uh, faster uh, recover uh, than the 200, which is induced largely irreversible axonal injuries. And here is the quantification using this automatic method. And uh, we can see that with the 50, it's 50 flux, like it's almost uh, restored to the resting lines after like 20, 20 minutes, 12, 12 minutes uh, after three minutes flux. And with the more speed that we have tried, we almost see a um, speed dependent um, increase um, of this flux, of this um, axon beating. So therefore, based on the based on the uh, fact that it can largely re uh, reverse the beating um, under the mild stress conditions, we have concluded that the axons seems to show a resistive response to mild mechanical stress um, in the form that it, it will form the uh, um, reversible beatings um, several, several seconds um, following the uh, flux. And so next we want to um, understand what's the underlying mechanism that drives the formation of these axonal beatings. Um, in fact, the axonal beatings of these tube-like um, axons can be um, created by contraction in the radial direction, by dilation or by mix of these both. So we examined the, um, we examined, um, the uh, life um, axons before and after the flux. And we can see that um, this is the 3D rendering of these live axons. We can see that immediately after the flux, um, the axons, the volume and the, um, the diameters of these axons is reduced. Um, this, we also um, examine the profile distribution of these diameters. While we see a great in, uh, increase in the small diameter um, fractions, we didn't see obvious um, change in the large diameter uh, fractions. So it seems that um, the creation of these beating, axonal beatings are more likely driven by the non, um, by, by the um, contraction of the axon in their diameter. And because the axon diameter is very close to the resolution limit of conventional uh, confocal microscope, we also use the super resolution um, lattice seam to capture that uh, phenomenon. And we can draw a similar conclusion that the flux induce a contraction um, of the diameter. So we have um, kind of gave a conclusion that these reversible beatings, uh, the flux induced the reversible beating seems to be driven by the contraction um, of these um, axons. So as the axons is actually structurally intensified with MPS um, structure as shown here, um, and uh, in our previous work that we know that this, um, this MPS, the acting rings are actually radially contractible so, and the contraction of these actin rings are actually driven by the actomyosin. The actomyosin is basically composed of the non-muscle uh, non motor, as well as the uh, periodic actin rings. And unconsuming un un ATP, uh, the non-muscle motor will drive the contraction of the actin rings, which narrows down the diameter of these, uh, of these axon diameters. And it has a um, specific inhibitor, blabistatin, and uh, several mutants to manipulate the activity of non-muscle myosin tube. 
And um, um, we also know that this uh, radio contraction can greatly uh, and heavily impact the functions of the axon. It inhibits the, um, the cargo trafficking and also impacts the um, action potential firing. And uh, therefore, we think this is very likely to control a new form of structural plasticity of the, of the axon and of the neuron as well. So our question extended to, does the actomyosin dependent radio, radio contraction of the axon play any roles in that? So we used a, a serial of uh, um, pharmacological inhibitors of the axon, of the axon non-myosin 2 to um, manipulate the activity of actomyosin. In control neurons, we can see um, when the flux comes in, the beating process is really dynamic back here, and then it recovered. However, when we use the two um, blocker of the non-muscle myosin, uh, non myosin 2 activity, um, ML7 and blebistatin, this beating process is largely inhibited. And if we use the activator, uh, calliculin A, of the uh, ectomyosin activity, um, because pre-existing beating is very, um, is very big already, uh, and uh, um, the actin, the, the flux induced beating is also sort of um, inhibited. And uh, the same thing happens if we use the um, inhibitor for the actin, F actin, um, disrupted F actin network by latroculin B. The stress induced axonal beating is also largely abolished, as we have shown there. So, uh, in summary, the uh, inhibitor of the actomyosin is going to greatly abolish the uh, flux-induced axonal beating process, suggesting that the actomyosin seems to be the um, molecular basis underlying the flux-induced axonal beating. And we have um, used the, the two molecular mutants of non-muscle myosin 2, which is the SD-activated um, form and assay is the inactivated form. And we can see that the flux induced axonal beating was uh, greatly inhibited in the um, inactivated NM2 form. So we have um, now gave a conclusion on this part that um, with the mild stress conditions, um, the axons is going to form transient and reversible axonal beatings. And this sort of axonal beatings is driven by the radio contraction of the actomyosin. And we think this is a reflect a new form of structural pl plasticity in axon um, that in response to the flux. However, so the most important question we want to know that what's the physiological function of these axonal beatings? Are, the, are these beatings is going to be re resistant to this mechanical stress? So before we answer this question, we can see um, this movie that we have flux um, we have flux in the distal chamber only. However, um, we didn't, and this distal chamber has a significant uh, axonal beating formation. However, in the channel and the, the more uh, remote um, soma chamber, we didn't see any significant change of the axon. It seems that this beating is significant, but it has a mechanism to restrict to the flux, the flux the region. So. We think it is, as we summarized here, that um, the beating is, seems to be restricted to the flux the region. So as we know that the axon is part of a single cell and the single cell neuron has a calcium inside. Um, calcium and calcium is the earliest sign of axon injury and the spreading of calcium to other part um, of the injured cell can trigger further degradation of the whole neuron. And so when we have another look of the um, mild stress, the axons that we can see that the axon um, compared to the 200, um, which is irreversibly damaged um, axons, they have a increased, um, progressively increased calcium signals. Um, this like reversibly uh, increased axons has a, um, the, axon, the, the axon calcium signal is reversed almost to the baseline uh, within like several sec, several minutes. And uh, another key uh, difference is that these uh, calcium signals is restricted to these beating areas. They're not um, prevalently waved like um, calcium surge. So it 
seems to us, and it's more clear in these images, that the bidding um, holds restrict these elevated calcium signals. And uh, it, we summarized the here that we can see a clear increase of the calcium signal in the speeding areas. However, in the between areas, they're decreased. Therefore, it creates a kind of hydrogeneity. This kind of beating structure is going to um, retard the um, long range trafficking of this calcium uh, wave, which is detrimental to the injured uh, neurons. And we can see that uh, the beating, uh, the calcium transmission along the beating area along the beating axon is much slower than that on the non-beating axons. And uh, what if, if, we block, if we block the axon of beating with the blebistatin? Uh, we use the non-autofluorescent uh, analog PNB of the blebistatin, and we can see that after we're blocking the, uh, partially blocking the axon of beating, there is a much higher frequency of uh, um, the calcium fairing follow, uh, following the um, flux. Um, and uh, we can summarize it here that we can see much higher frequency of the axon beating. Therefore, the um, recovery rate of the of these elevated calcium signals in the hot spots is greatly reduced if we block the beating. So um, take an advantage. So we know that non, uh, the axon the along the non-beating axons, the calcium wave travels really fast and take the advantage of our uh, device that we examine. We, if, we, if we induce flux here, what will happen in the soma part? Um, so we can see that in the control axons, when the distal part, which is the stressed, has a very high uh, level of calcium surge. Um, however, in the more remote and not stressed um, proximal part, the calcium uh, increase is is relatively um, slow, uh, it's re relatively small. And if we block axonal beatings with the PNB, uh, we can see that um, there, the increase in the proximal part, the calcium increase is greatly uh, increased, suggesting that the axonal beatings indeed restrict the spreading, long range spreading of the calcium waves from these stressed areas. So we eventually also check the uh, final fate of these stress axons. Um, if we block the, uh, if we block this uh, axonal beating formation with the blebistatin, we can see a clear increase is in the axonal degeneration rate um, in this in this flux uh, axons. In the two with the two markers have the same same uh, result. So based on this. Um, um, experimental evidence, we have drawn our working model that the axons of CNS neurons could resist mild mechanical stress. And this kind of um, uh, resistance um, can happen, um, induce the reversible axonal beating um, in the stressed regions only. And uh, this kind of axonal beating is reversible and depend on the activity of actomyosin too. And the contracted axon restrict um, the long range spreading of the detrimental axon waves to further um, to cause further disruption, uh, destructive effects um, in the stressed axon, in the stressed axon and the neuron. And therefore, this machinery is a novel mechanical protective mechanism in CNS neurons. And this work was um, largely um, conducted by my first PhD student. Um, also helped with a master student and undergraduate st student of the Shanghai Tech, and we thank all these collaborators in the QBI, um, no, in the in the University of Queensland, and also the um, Shanghai Tech and uh, um, ION, and as well as our great facilities. And this is my findings. Um, and thanks for listening. Um, any questions? Thank you, Tong, for a great talk. Uh, we're open for questions. Hong Yan. Oh, yeah. So I came a bit late. So I hope I, uh, you can all hear me? Yes. yes. OK. Uh, my question is that the axonal beating would, would also inevitably um, slow down the axonal transport. Or, I mean, yes. auto, and also, um, how does it um, help to regenerate? And also, what happens to microtubule dynamics? 
So this is a really good question. Um, we actually also have a, a, a bit of a look at the axonal trafficking, and we can see that the the axonal cargo seems to be greatly affected by this uh, contraction and the beating formation. And um, um, after uh, several minutes afterwards, um, it will partially recover from this um, like freezing um, freezing uh, situation. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yes, I have two questions to Tom. <laughs> nice yes. to, it's so, so glad to see you here. Um, long time no see each other. Um, yes, uh, one, the first question is, uh, um, uh, so what's the, the, the medium uh, you used for for, for the uh, injur injury flow, right? Uh, okay. To, to make the, the axon bleeding. I'm wondering, uh, yes, uh, if you uh, whether you use the same exactly the same uh, same culture medium or you use different medium when you place like the axon in a very fresh uh, situ uh, medium or even PBS wh whether the uh, you can induce this kind of phenotype of axon uh, beating. So we use exactly the same cultured medium, sometimes conditioned medium, um, to induce this um, beating. So you are circulating um, the 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 exact medium. You are circulating uh, within this culture system, circulating the medium within the culture system, right? No, we don't circulate. We just inject them and then uh, we just uh, remove the uh, outflux because this is a very tiny, um, very very tiny um, device. So you only need about um, uh, I see, I see, you, you only need about uh, one mil one mil. Um, of the medium for the whole experiment. It's very wow. tiny. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. The second question is, uh, so uh, I saw uh, the axons actually still growing to different uh, directions uh, when, but the flow is uh, the same, should be the same like direction. So when you see uh, the axon uh, growth in parallel with this kind of uh, flow, so what's the strength, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what's the phenotype, uh, whether it's different when the uh, axon is uh, grow, uh, like against this uh, flow? So it's a great question. Um, <laughs> we have actually questioned by the, the reviewer um, um, in, in our submission. So about the angle, we have do the simulation and uh, um, I, didn't, I didn't include that data. Um, with the different uh, directions of the axon, um, the um, the stress it receives is um, different in about twofold. So if you are very you are uh, completely vert uh, uh, vertical um, perpendicular to this flux injecting uh, direction, you receive the most uh, stronger um, stress. And if you are kind of like the same direction with the flux, you are going to receive a, a smaller uh, stress. But the difference between these two extremes is within the twofold, less than twofold, one point also. So we have done a um, control of these different angles. Um, we have analyzed the beating situations of different angled axons, and we didn't see a signi significant difference in these uh, different angled axons. So we, we think that um, it might be a little bit different for the angles, but the main difference for this for their response is um, induced by different flux velocity. So we use velocity difference um, to control the beating um, beating degree in the following experiment. Thank you. Thanks, Xiaoju. Um, Dr. Mobley, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm thinking about axonal transport now, and I'm wondering, are you seeing um, organelle movement accumulating in uh, beads, or are you finding them distributed both in the bead, but also between beads? Okay, I think this question is um, also um, uh, kind of um, uh, amused me, um, attract, I, I was also attracted to this question. So as I have shown that, the um, 
these organelles, so we labeled the mitochondria only. So the mitochondria seems to be freezed by this uh, contraction, by this flux induced beating formation. And then we analyzed the, actually we analyzed the locations of these um, mitochondria and see uh, they are largely overlap with the beating. So they're in the uh, beads. They're sitting they're in, in the, the beads. beads. Mm -hmm. And the bees. And the reason that they appear like a bees, in our opinion, is that they cannot contract to the outmost as the like in between areas because they have some organelles inside. So that the axon become like a like string of pearl structure just because they have too much organelles inside. And this string was like contracted uh, a lot more than this one contains the organelles. So we also analyzed intervals between these beating areas and we didn't see a um, uh, like um, correlation between their space. So it means that they are not um, periodic and it seems to be randomly controlled by the location of locations of these organelles. So that's our theory. We haven't to do too much test on that, but this is just a, a very simple observation. Thanks for your question. So the, so the organelle, so the, the, the moving membranes could actually contribute to the size of the beading. The, the organelles that are not moving, that are accumulating in beads could actually add to that volume, I suppose. I suppose so, but um, in order to that, uh, in order to Proof that I think we need to label more um, more organelles and observe them longer to see whether they gradually build up um, the beating and eventually this beating becomes a swelling. But we haven't done that yet. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tong. Awesome talk. And uh, now we're up for our next speaker, which uh, Zhong you'll introduce. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. So, um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, my colleague in uh, Nanjing. Now it's Guangzhou. It's the Dong Xu. A Dong. Actually, so uh, sorry. It's my confusion because the Dong's last name is also Dong in China. Mm -hmm. So, so Yun Shi uh, Dong. So, uh, uh, Dong has got his bachelor degree in Nanjing University, uh, working in biological sciences. After, um. Um, bachelor degree, Stone went to US, uh, uh, has his PhD, PhD degree in Georgia State. After PhD, um, Stone went to UCSF to work with Georgia Nicole, where he started with his journey with um, um, glutamate receptors ever since. So um, in 2013, Stone started his own lab in Nanjing University, um, uh, working on the uh, series of uh, human psychiatric disorder as well as me learning memory, uh, focusing on the uh, glutamine receptors. Uh, in recent years, um, he has a series, uh, series of amazing paper in neuron and molecular psychiatry, uh, finding out um, not, not only the MDA receptors, but also uh, the uh, MDA uh, MPA receptors as interesting role in cognition disorders. So Stone went, uh, moved to um, uh, Guang, Guangdong, um, uh, um, uh, in Institute of uh, Brain Science, I, I, I believe. The new, ins new ins institute uh, is burning up in the in, uh, um, new district in Zhuhai. It's a beautiful um, campus uh, by, the, by the ocean. I hope, I hope some of you um, will visit there. Okay, today uh, Stone will tell us the latest in his own lab about a a role of AMD, AM empire receptors in LTP and the human uh, cognition disorders. And so, my, we try on share slide. Did you see a slide? Okay, go ahead. Works. Stone, you're still muted. So you might you might try a new network or a hotspot from a cell phone. I couldn't see you. I 
and we can't hear you, so you're on mute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I cannot share my screen. Okay. Let me see. I guess I cannot uh, uh, use the full screen for this uh, PPT. So let me just uh, uh, just uh, directly it goes through it. Right. Okay. You're still not sharing your screen. Uh, uh, thank you, Tula. thank you, Aaron. We we don't see your we don't see your slides. Uh, but it seems that uh, on my did you share it? So it's getting out. Okay, try it again. You, you're muted. Okay. All right. Try it again. Okay, great. Go ahead. Uh, you put it on the slideshow. Okay. Uh, play. Uh, yeah. I, I... Thank you for this. So let me just uh, go through it. Okay. Uh, so the. Long, can you make sure his network is better? Paston, your, your network is terrible. You, you might just try a, a cell phone hotspot. We couldn't see you, couldn't hear you. Yes. Yeah. It's baffling how we've been doing Zoom calls for three years and some people still don't know how to give a presentation on Zoom. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Let's yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Zilong. Thank you, Aaron, for inviting me uh, to talk about some of my work. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the AMP receptor subunit in RGB and the cognitive disorders. Oh. Okay. Uh, there are two stories. One is uh, uh, GLUE A1 that uh, mediate RGB maintenance through interaction with the neuroplastin 65. And the other one is the dysfunction of GLUE-A3 promotes aggressive behavior in human. Uh, so let me briefly introduce uh, the RTP. So that uh, in 1940s, uh, uh, Dr. Heber, uh, That means those uh, synaptic transmission. Uh, I guess you don't hear me, right? We can hear you, but it's very bad quality. Uh, yeah, his voice is broken. So uh, yeah, I say let me just slow it down. Uh, so uh, for this uh, Hebian rules, uh, neurons that fight together. That works to uh, form functional units. And the first evidence of the uh, plasticity comes, comes from the RTP uh, that uh, uh, was published in 1973 uh, by Bliss and Noma. They find in uh, rabbit hippocampus, uh, tetanic stimulation can cause long term potentiation in synaptic transmission. Uh,
uh, for studying LGP in following years. There's uh, when we consider the uh, mechanism, there's uh, two possibilities. One is a uh, uh, presynaptic neurotransmit neurotransmitter release is increased after LTP induction. The other is a uh, post-synaptic mechanism. Uh, that is to say that uh, more receptors uh, went to synapse after LTP induction. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, somehow called ATP war, and uh, some people stand on uh, both sides. They both have evidence. And uh, uh, finally, uh, people believe that uh, in CA1 neurons, that uh, LTP is mostly through the post synaptic mechanism. Now, people uh, believe that uh, the MDA receptor uh, is activated and uh, mechanism blocker is removed by tetanic uh, stimulation, and then calcium can enter through the NDA receptor and trigger uh, a tons of uh, biochemical reaction in the uh, spine, uh, including carmodulin, uh, chem kinase 2 or other protein kinase activation and cause uh, phosphorylation of AMPA receptor. And thus, more AMPA receptor enter to the synaptic membrane and the media uh, potentiation. Um, after that, uh, it becomes how this AMPA receptor uh, is uh, uh, regulated uh, during this uh, LTP process. Uh, one uh, greatest uh, theory is the AMPA receptor subunit rule. Uh, Dr. Uh, Man Manino uh, find that uh, when uh, in brain slices, when GLUA1 is introduced uh, through virus, uh, then this overexpressed GLUA1 cannot enter the synapse until you have a titanic uh, stimulation. Uh, but the GLUA2 is different. Uh, when you have the GLUA2 overexpressed, you have that uh, GLUA2 enter the uh, synapse in, at the basal condition. Therefore, uh, the risk uh, theory that uh, GLUA2 A3 mediate the basal, tran basal transmission uh, uh, using the GLUA2 based on trans uh, translocation uh, and the glue A1 and A2, uh, the heter uh, heteromers media the potentiation after the neuronal activity. So, this uh, theory actually uh, affect uh, has a uh, very uh, is great and have a long time effect and it guided the following uh, study in about 20 years. Um, so now question become, uh, what is the difference between GLUA1 and GLUA2 and what is the mechanism? Uh, when we look at the sequence of this uh, GLUA1 and the GLUA2, uh, the major difference is that uh, the amino terminal domain uh, and also the C terminal domains, uh, and why the core domains like uh, ligand binding domains and the transmembrane core domains uh, are actually very similar between glue A1 and A2. Uh, 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 in this uh, review paper, uh, uh, Dr. Kugnia uh, uh, summarized uh, the uh, study on the C terminal. Uh, because this is uh, very uh, reasonable because the C terminal, you know, that uh, a lot of uh, protein kinase are uh, located intracellularly and uh, modulate the C terminal of those uh, uh, receptors. And uh, a fruitful uh, achievement have been done uh, during this 20 years. And a lot of uh, phosphorylation side, uh, protein binding side, uh, also the translational modification side um, are found. Um, however, like uh, uh, all of this theory in the LTP area, uh, there are always some uh, uh, different uh, uh, opinion. Um, this paper uh, done by uh, Roger Nikolaev uh, 
find uh, that uh, uh, they use a, 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 a system uh, that first they remove all the endogenous AMPA receptor and they replace with uh, uh, GLUA1 or GLUA2. Um, uh, in this uh, study, uh, they find that uh, GLUA1 and GLUA2 uh, somehow seem to be uh, same uh, in ATP induction. And uh, uh, they also find that GLUA1 CTD somehow a lot uh, uh, exclusively required for ATP. Um, however, this uh, study somehow uh, is not complete because uh, later, uh, a few few years later, uh, uh, the Lico lab also says, okay, uh, GLU A1 and A2 are actually uh, really different. However, that difference is not uh, because the C terminal are, not, are different. Actually, probably is that the amino terminal domains are different. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Gradient lab also find the same uh, results uh, and the publishers with the uh, same result. And uh, the that says, okay, the different of glu A1 and A2 in synaptic transmission and the RTP uh, probably rely on uh, ATD. And we actually, uh, in my lab, we uh, also find some of this evidence. So I will, I'm going to show this uh, for you. Uh, just as I said that, Where did he go? I got lost. Um, so what do you, why don't we see if Stone could um, give a talk at a, another time once his internet's back? Yeah, I think it's uh, tick, tick, tick too long. It's the, yeah. This network is always an issue. Yeah. Um, Maybe we can have a practice session with him or something. Mm -hmm. Just given the time. Yeah, I let, let him know this problem and. Uh, yeah. Over that. Sorry, sorry everyone, but um, Hong, amazing talk with cool, cool discoveries. Yes, excellent. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we'll work with Stone to get his. Uh, internet back working well mm -hmm. and um, sure, sure. We'll, we'll see everyone next week for spatial epigenomics and microglia innervating uh, sending signals to the heart. Sure.